thanks everyone for coming. Um, and yeah, we're really excited and really happy to have Alex, uh, my colleague from the UK, um, joining us today uh, to deliver what I'm sure is going to be um, a really interesting, really useful, really practical session. So Alex, uh, over to you. Thanks for joining us. No worries. And thank you for having me, Will. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for joining today's session. Just to give you a bit more information about who I am. So my name is Alex and I am the senior ELT consultant at National Geographic Learning in the EMEA region. So I'm based in Europe and based in the UK and I travel around Europe, the Middle East, North Africa, but not quite as far as Asia. Um, Will has the pleasure of, of, of that region. Um, and I've been working in ELT since 2004 as a teacher, as a director of studies and as a teacher trainer and now with National Geographic Learning as their senior academic consultant. And today we're going to be talking all about visible thinking routines in the English language classroom. And the reason this is sort of interesting to me is because teachers are not just teachers. Our role is multifaceted. We are, yes, teaching English, but we are also teaching the student and developing them to be better prepared for life in the real world. Um, and we'll come back to the idea very shortly. But just to give you an idea of where we're going in this webinar, how we're gonna travel. We're gonna start off just by identifying what exactly we mean by visible thinking routines. And then secondly, about why. Why should we bother? Why should we be concerned about including these in our language classrooms. And then finally, I'm gonna give you lots and lots of practical ideas to take away with you to use in your classrooms, okay? And I do wanna point out that these routines can be used with all age groups. It doesn't just have to be high level academic students. It could be at secondary school, it could be at middle school, primary school even as well, depending on the level of the learners, okay? Now, a little word of warning. I like to make my webinars interactive. And I can see you've already found the chat box, you're doing really well there, but we're gonna be using the chat box throughout the session, okay? And I wanna start with a question for you. And that is this. What, in your opinion, what in your view, is the purpose of 21st century education? And I don't just mean English language teaching, I mean education as a whole of which English language teaching is part of. So have a quick think and then share your thoughts, share your ideas with everyone in the chat. And there is no right answer here, there's no wrong answer. Just your own views, your opinions. Okay, so Kulong Huang said they're all about leadership, developing future leaders. Absolutely, I like that. That's certainly part of it. To make them more creative, maybe more competitive, thinking out of the box. Thank you, Amir. Learning from real life, 4C, so Sam, so communication, critical thinking, collaboration and creativity, more challenges, upskilling, learning independence. Thank you, Marie. Um, Student-centered, thank you, Cheng Chun. Uh, meaningful learning, critical thinking, lifelong learners. Thank you, I love that one. Uh, Michelle says 21st century skills, good, perfect. So like, you know, we can see here, there is no singular answer to this question, but a lot of you are pointing out here, it is actually, it's more holistic in terms of what we're achieving. We're not just teaching a subject, in our case, English or for other student teachers, geography or maths or history or whatever it might be. We have a, a wider purpose of, than that. Yes, we're teaching a subject, but we're training or giving them the skills, the knowledge, the abilities to survive and thrive in a globalized interconnected world. And this quote really summed it up for me. It's about giving a student a set of skills, abilities and knowledge that they need in order to succeed in learning, work, and life in the information age. So yes, we're teaching a subject, but 
it's more than that. And I think, you know, we can talk about knowledge another time, but what I want to focus on is skills and specifically the cognitive skills, because that is, I think, it's absolute imperative that we help our students to, de to develop. Okay, and when I say cognitive skills, I mean specifically their higher order thinking skills, their ability to apply knowledge, to analyze, to evaluate, to create. Because I think you'll agree with me that for too long, students have been spoon fed information, argu arguably through no fault of their own, but they've been spoon fed by their teachers, meaning that they've got really good lots skills. So the low order thinking skills of understanding and remembering, but those higher order thinking skills, they haven't been developed, at least to sufficient levels that they need when they get to a university age and beyond. And so, you know, teenagers especially, they need to start thinking for themselves, developing those thinking skills. And so, we need to think about how we can help to facilitate that process. How we can help them see their own thinking processes and help us to see our students and how they think. Because after all, thinking is an invisible process, it's an invisible action. So how can we make them visible? Well, that is what we're looking at today, these ideas of visible thinking routines. So. I just want to ask you a quick question. Before today's, seeing today's title, have any of you actually heard the term visible thinking routines? Let me know in the chat box with a simple yes or no. Michelle says yes, Kevin says yes. I get a few yeses, but probably more no's. I should have done this as a poll. Um, okay. Okay, you read about visible learning. That's a Different aspect, but equally important. Talking about John Hattie there. Okay, that's good. So let's have a look then. What exactly are visible thinking routines? So essentially they are, well, I'm gonna give you a little quote here. They are short, easy to learn mini strategies that extend and deepen students thinking and become part of the structure of everyday classroom life. And they come from an organization called Project Zero, which quite frankly, sounds like some secret CIA, CIA FBI uh, organization in the USA. That is a great book. I can't read, I think it's Chinese. I can't read Chinese, but it's a really good uh, book that making visible uh, think making things visible so yeah project zero is this organization based out of harvard graduate school of education in the united states and it was actually founded in 1967 so it's been going for a really long time and their entire mission is to help understand and enhance learning thinking and creativity for individuals uh, and to integrate that into their everyday classes, okay? And essentially it's, it's a broad and very, very flexible framework for enriching classroom learning and content areas while fostering that intellectual development at the same time. Amir, absolutely, critical thinking is a subcategory of visible thinking without question, it's, it's critical to it um, because Thank you, we'll be showing that link later on. Um, because yeah, visible thinking links to critical thinking, it links to creative thinking as well, okay? And as such, they can help to create a culture of thinking which enables students to, to understand pro thought processes, those cognitive processes, okay? Um, but what I do wanna say at this point is that these routines, they were not developed exclusively for the English language classroom. They were developed for education as a whole. But I became interested in them and thought about how I could utilize them in my classes. Now, to help me do that, 
they have actually got a something they called the the toolbox, the visible thinking routines toolbox, which you can download from or access from the, the that website there, the one that Will just shared as well. And essentially it's about 80 different activities that look at different areas. So we can see some here, possibilities and analogies, perspectives, controversies, dilemmas, perspective taking, synthesizing, digging deeper, exploring ideas. So they cover a range of sort of areas and, and what we'll see is thinking dispositions, um, but not all of them are relatable to English language teaching, but many of them are. So I, I explored them. I went into them in real detail about which ones would work in our context, which ones might not. Because, well, we'll look at why we should use them in a moment. So that's what they are in, in a nutshell. But why? Why should we use them? The very simple answer to that question, and it's this. It's because learning is a consequence of thinking. Not something we attack on for good measure, but something in which we must actively engage to promote our own and others' learning. So if we want students to learn, they need to be able to think effectively as well, right? Um, but there are other advantages too. So yes, it develops their link, uh, thinking and learning abilities, but it actually gives them deeper understanding of content. Now, that content might be a reading they've done in class, it might be a listening, it might be a TED talk that they've watched, but it allows them to interact with the text beyond just the surface, beyond just answering comprehension questions. In other words, it's more real life. Because in real life, you don't read an article or watch something and then answer comprehension questions. You think about it, you reflect on it, you talk about it with other people, right? And that creates a deeper understanding of the content. The research also tells us from Project Zero that it provides greater motivation for learning as a result because it is more real life. It is more interactive, it is more learner-centered, right? And as Lovely says, yeah, it does help prepare the mindset of the learner as well. The research also tells us that the learner's attitudes to learning improves. And certainly, you know, this idea of motivation and positive attitude is something we want for all of our students in class. And it's something I get asked a lot from teachers all around the world. How can I motivate? How can I improve my students' attitude to learning? Bringing these routines into the classroom is one way of doing that because it's getting them to share their views, their opinions. It's learner focused. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. It's involving of all students in the class. And so, therefore, there is a noticeable shift in classroom culture towards more enthusiastically engaged thinkers and learners. And again, that is something we want for our students, without question. And then I think from our perspective as a language teacher, we could argue that the next point is probably the most helpful, the most positive, you know, the strongest reason why we should use them in the classroom. And that's because it in facilitates a more inclusive and communicative classroom. It drives communication, you think, you speak, you share your thoughts, your ideas, it's about opinions. It's about sharing those with one another, talking through things together to come up with ideas, to create understanding of, of whatever it is we've been reading or, or listening to. So if we want to have a communicative classroom that is very much student focused, then bringing these routines into the classroom is a great way of doing that. So how? How do we do this? How can we use them in the English language classroom? So let's now look at different routines we could use. Now we've explored what and why we should use them. And the first way we're going to use them is with 
images. Now, if you're like me, you love using images in your classes because they're such an easy resource to bring in and something for students to relate to. You know, they, they are the visual generation. They get their phones out, they're talking about photos all the time. But let's take this element and bring it into the classroom and add a little twist to it. So the first routine I want to introduce you to is one you're probably already familiar with, um, but it is a visible thinking routine. And it's called, I see, I think, I wonder. And I love this routine because it starts off on a very basic level, I see. So it's the lower order thinking skills. I see this, I understand it, I'm remembering some words from this photo. But then I think, well, what do I think is happening? You tell me in the chat box, what do you think is happening here, guys? What is happening in this picture, do you think? So start your sentence, I think. And certainly, you know, working with National Geographic Learning content, you have access to great photography. I think he's feeding the shark. Thank you, Christine. Any other suggestions? I think they are checking the shark's teeth. I think it's feeding time. I think they're dividing with the shark. I think it's the shark dentist, maybe. I think he wants to experience something crazy. I think the diver is interacting with the shark. I think they're trying to redirect the shark. I think the shark is in pain. I think they're trying to film the shark. I think they're feeding the shark. Okay, brilliant. I think the shark is curious about them. I think it's a tourist activity. Loads of great ideas here. Thank you. So that's kind of involving slightly more higher order thinking skills. But then we go to the next level, the I wonder which is essentially getting them to ask questions and really to get under the skin of the photo. What do you wonder about the photo? For example, I wonder why this man is doing this. I wonder what his wife thinks of him doing this. So again, in the chat box, tell me what you wonder about this photo. Love, I love that, Lynn. I wonder how much he is paid. I wonder why the shark is not attacking them. I wonder if it's worth doing. Thank you, Wei Fong Chang. Uh, I wonder what the guy is sitting on. And <laughs> that's a good question. I wonder if the man is careful. I wonder how sharp the teeth are. I wonder what the photographer is saying. Yeah, that's a great one, right? I wonder who's taking this photo because someone's taking this photo. I wonder how he's feeling. I wonder why they're placing themselves in danger. I wonder where this is. I wonder how many minutes they were underwater. Thank you, Svet. I wonder how deep the water is. I wonder if they got bitten. Okay, amazing. So we've elicited all of these I wonder statements from our students. We might have written some of them on the board. But all of the content for this activity is student generated. The teacher has done nothing apart from put the activity on the board. And then what I would do, I'd put my students into groups and I'd get them to discuss those I wonder statements. So like Joey C said, how would you feel if it's you? Discuss that question. I wonder if there's something in the shark's mouth or do you think there's something in the shark's mouth? Um, I wonder why the, what the man in red is doing. Well, what do you think the man in red is doing? Uh, I wonder how much this activity helps researchers and scientists. Well, what do you think? So essentially what you've done, the students have created their own discussion questions. And because of that, they have ownership. They are more likely to have answers and to be involved in the following discussion activity. Right? Um, because it's all been generated by them, it's come from them. So I love this task because it could last five minutes, it could last half an hour, depending on the photo and how much the students are wondering about it. But it's a great way to start lessons. Um, and, you know, all kinds of pictures it could be used with, right? And it doesn't have to be pictures in course books, it could be pictures that you find online that, that are in the news. Um, 
let's have a look at this one as well. What do you think is happening in this photo? What do you wonder about this photo? Let's see what you come up with for this one. So what do you think? What do you wonder? I think it's a quarantine site. Thank you, Michelle. I think it's research on sleep. Thank you, Rena, Nancy. I think oh, everyone thinks they're in quarantine. I think they're sleeping with music. It's a science experiment. I wonder what they're testing for. Lovely Christine. Yeah, I wonder why they're doing this. I think they're trying to record people's dreams. It's an, I think it's an experiment about dreams. I think it's a movie of the future. They're doing a Guinness World Record attempt. Okay, and this is the beauty. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just your views, your opinions. And that in itself encourages greater student interaction. Because from my experience as a teacher, students don't like putting their hands up if they think there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Because they don't want to get the answer wrong. This way, you're taking away that fear of speaking in class. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. I wonder, does music play a part in our dreams? Exactly, I think it's a great lead into it, to a reading, to a unit, uh, to a listening, even if you've got that visual input. And, you know, this connection between thinking and photos, it's not a surprising one. It's, it's an idea that goes back a long, long time. It goes back to the time of Aristotle in fifth century BC Athens, because he said this, without image, thinking is impossible. And I just love that quote. Without image, thinking is impossible. We see a photo, we think something. We have a reaction of some, some sort, right? Okay. Uh, a variation on that is an activity called interview the picture. And again, it's getting students to think beyond just, I can see a shark and I can see a canoeist and I can see blue water and an island. It's thinking about what you'd like to ask the people, the things in the photograph. So, very simple. What questions would you like to ask the person in the picture? Or indeed, what questions would you like to ask the shark? So again, in the chat box, what would you like to ask the people or the person, the shark in the photo? Hi, Miss Evangeline from Thailand. Okay, do you see the shark following? Thank you, Lani. Are you scared? How did you escape? Why is the shark falling? Are you hungry, shark? Do you know you have a new friend? Why are you thinking of us people? <laughs> is that your pet shark? What, was your attention to find a shark? Be alert? Okay, good. Again, lots of ideas coming through here. And again, what you could do as a teacher, you could write some of these questions on the board and then as a follow-up activity, you can invite students to role play the photograph. So one of the students is the person on the boat, the other is the interviewer, and it's a creative task where students can, you know, ask and answer the question, is the shark your pet? No, it's not my pet. Um, do you think the shark is a friend or a foe? Why are you afraid of us? Well, the reason I'm afraid of you is you're, you're six times the size of me, you've got really sharp teeth, and I know that you like to eat meat, um, for example. Are you lost? No, I'm not lost. And so on. So involve some creativity there. Okay, so that's two activities we can do with the photos for, for uh, visible thinking. Another one is an idea called the three dimensions of viewing and getting students to react to an image in three different ways. So the first one is called the personal viewing or the effective viewing. And this is essentially you and the photograph. So how does the photo make you feel? And why does it make you feel that way? Does it remind you of anything? Do you think it's positive or negative? Why? So it's reacting to it from your own personal view. So tell me in the chat, how does this photo make you feel? For my half, 
it, it makes me feel a little bit sad because, you know, a, a fairground should be a place of fun and enjoyment. But here it's, you know, just been left to the elements. Nostalgic, confused. It makes you want to play. Okay, so lovely. And then what you do is you put the students in pairs and say, well, why does it make you feel confused? Why does it make you feel like a child? Why does it make you feel disappointed? They're explaining why. They're explaining their emotions to one another. So it's actually really good for social emotional learning activity as well. The second viewing is what we're more familiar with. It's what I can see essentially. It's the structural viewing or the compositional viewing. So it's, you know, what is happening in the image? What might lie outside of the image? What's they're focusing on why? So I'm gonna move on from that one quite quickly to the third viewing, which is the critical viewing or the ideological viewing. And this is again, that kind of going beneath the surface. What is the message here? What is the purpose of this photo? Can it be interpreted in more than one way? And how might that be? Right, because photos, especially National Geographic photos, they all have a story. But what is that story? What is that message, do you think? So any, any suggestions here? What do we think might be the message being conveyed by this photograph? Maybe children should be allowed to play? Yeah, potentially. About lost childhood? Yeah, I love the idea, Michelle. Definitely one way of interpreting it. And again, that's the beauty. There's no right answer here. There's no wrong answer. It's how you interpret it. Humans are part of the world. We're replaceable. Young at heart, maybe. Maybe about how, you know, nature will always come back. Time marches on. The elderly want to be like kids again. We all want to be kids, right? Tapping into your inner child. There's always a child in us. Yeah. How the world is changing. Okay, great. Lots of great different interpretations of the, you know, of the message there. Okay, let's move on because time is running by really quickly. So what I want to look at now are some visible thinking routines that we can do pre-topic or pre-reading or pre-listening, okay? And the first activity I want to introduce you to is called the three whys. And this is a routine that is designed to nurture and discern the significance of a situation or a topic while keeping in three different perspectives, okay? So not just seeing it from my point of view, but seeing it from different points of view. So here, for example, we've got a, a unit all about fast fashion and the impact of fast fashion. So the first why is, about me. Why might this topic, why might this question matter to me as an individual person? Okay, so that kind of egotistical view on it. And they can talk about that quite easily because it's making a connection to them, to themselves. Okay. It then moves to the next level of why might it matter to the people around me? to my family, my friends, my city, my country. So it's more of a, a local connection. And then the third why, can anyone guess what the third why might be? We've gone from me to kind of local community to, what do you think the next step might be? Yeah, the world. Why does it matter globally? Exactly, Joe and Zabon, Zaboniso, Keisha, exactly right. Why might it matter to the world? So you get students, give them two or three minutes on their own to reflect on this individually. Then you put them into groups to discuss those three questions. Because why it matters to me will be very different to why it matters to somebody else or it might matter to people in other countries, right? So, you know, in the UK, it's a very consumerist society. And so the idea of fast fashion is great. I'm a consumer of that, but there's a big impact on that maybe elsewhere in the world, for example, the impact 
on environment, impact on working conditions in other countries, for example. Okay, well, you can ask them post this thing as well, absolutely well. But really it's meant to, it's meant to activate that schemata, that knowledge before reading or, or listening. An alternative to the three whys is called question starts. And this is essentially a routine to help students produce good thought provoking questions that are, you know, that are more in depth, that they provoke inquiry. And it helps them to brainstorm different types of question about a topic. Because I think very often when we get students to think of questions, they can be quite basic questions. But if we give them the question starts or a question frame, it can help them to create the right kinds of questions. So let's imagine we're doing this lesson on fast fashion. Look at the qu different question frames there and write me some questions in the chat box. So what are the reasons something? What if, what if we knew? What would change if, suppose that? Have a quick think and then share some ideas. They are WH questions, but it's more of a, a framework for them there, not just to ask the WH questions, like what if we knew? So what if we knew how badly fast fashion impacted on the environment 20 years ago? Or even what is fast fashion exactly? How would life be different if we were more responsible with our clothing choices? Lovely Lynn, great. What if I'd known or what if we knew child labor was involved? How would you feel when it happens now? Exactly, right? So we're getting more of a, a wider variety of questions here. It's kind of exploring that multi-dimensionality of a topic. But once again, the students are creating. Now these questions might be in a course book, but they're in a course book. These questions have been created by your students. Once again, they have ownership of them. They have accountability. And then you use these questions as your starting point for a discussion. Again, learner focused. Okay, so that's two routines we've seen so far. And what I will say is you wouldn't do all of these, okay? You just pick one of them to do each lesson, right? So I'm giving you a choice, giving you options here. Okay, let's look at another one. So this one is called Go Go. Um, and it's a, it's a brainstorming type task. Now, let's take a normal class, which I've, I've observed so many classes like this. The teacher says, okay, we're gonna be talking about this topic of the environment. What do you already know about the environment? What do you think needs to be done, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's an open question to the class. But the problem with that is that, from my experience, only a certain number of students answer, the strong ones, the confident ones. So let's say four or five students say something, the rest are in silence. It is not inclusive of everybody. Therefore, class brainstorms are not, for me, effective. Because I only find out what some students know, not what all students know. The go-go routine addresses that. It makes brainstorming applicable to everybody in the class. So what does GoGo -Go stand for? It stands for give one, get one. So how does it work? Well, first of all, the teacher has to set a question or a prompt. So for example, with this topic, we might ask the question, what do you think are the three best ways to live a greener life. And you give your students some time to write down their ideas. Just three. When everyone is ready, you turn it into a classroom mingle activity. 
everyone stands up, they find a partner and they give one of their ideas to another person, that, that, that partner, right? And they listen closely to each other. So I've given one idea to my first partner and then, so, I've, uh, so they listen to me and then I share one of my ideas with them. So it's a two-way street. I've given one, I've got one. And we can talk about those ideas. They then move on to another partner. And they talk about those ideas, but they also elaborate on them as well. So I chose this one on my list because it's not just say this is my idea, they're explaining why they should be doing this or why I think it's such a great idea. And you repeat that process multiple times so that by the end of the activity, they haven't just got three ideas on their piece of paper. They might have eight or nine or even 10 ideas on their piece of paper because they've been writing them down every time they've got a new idea. So as a brainstorming task, it involves every single student. Now, what you can then do at the end of the mingle activity, you can put students into groups to compare their lists, compare their ideas, or do whole class feedback. And that way, you can ensure that all students are involved in the process. And it's activated all of that knowledge, all of that schemata that they might have on the topic. So it's collaborative, it's communicative, it's kinesthetic because they're up and about moving around the classroom. Okay. We look at one more pre-reading routine, and it's one that I'm sure you are all familiar with, the KWL routine. In the chat box, let me know, are you familiar with the KWL routine? What does KWL stand for? Let me know. Absolutely right. No one to know, learn. So the K stands for what do I already know about this topic? So it's activating that existing schemata for the learner, pre-reading. Then what do I want to know? What do you want to know? What questions, what puzzles do you have about this topic of why do we dream? And at the end of it, we come back to it, what did I learn, right? So we're going to read this little article in, in a moment I'm going to zoom in for you but before we read it tell me what you already know and what questions you might have for why we dream let me know in the chat why do we dream what do you already know or what do you think you already know and what questions might you have Exactly that, Christine. It's all about activation of prior knowledge. And we know as teachers that, and there's a lot of research that goes into this, it's been got put into this, is that the more we activate schemata, the more connections we make to the students pre-reading, the easier the comprehension is of that text. Okay, the, bra the brain is active when we're sleeping. It's well when we desire something, maybe. Dreams help us rest. The unconscious part is bigger than the conscious part. That is why we dream. Okay, interesting, lovely. Dreams are part of what our subconscious wants. Okay, we know about REM. Dreams are random firings of neurons. I didn't know that. Our subconscious, we thought about it often. Dream is a motivation. We dream to forget about reality, maybe. Dreams are a reflection of what we think. I have a recurring dream that is more, more of a nightmare. <laughs> and it, it's like my teeth all falling out and crumbling out. It's a horrible, horrible dream. Um, so I'd like to know what, you know, do dreams have a connection to real life, right? Um, but what this does, it creates a purpose for reading. Well, I want to know why we dream. Why do we have nightmares? Why do we have these kind of dreams? Um, how do dreams help us? Do dreams help us? So again, it creates motivation. It creates engagement for the learners 
in reading a task or, or listening to something, right? So let's have a quick read of this article. I'm gonna give you two minutes to skim read it, okay? And I'm hoping it is big enough for you. So take some time to read. So hopefully that article's reinforced some of the things you already knew or thought you knew. Maybe it's answered some of the questions that you had pre-reading, but I'm sure that you all learned something from the article. Read, finish reading. Um, so, we're going to come back to the learned bit in a moment, because that was, we were focusing there on, on the pre-reading, right? So, we're going to move on now to the visible thinking routines that we can do post-reading or post-viewing. And the first one I want to introduce you to is just called 321. And this is a routine that helps students to reflect on what they have read or what they've listened to or watched on a deeper, more personal level. And it's also more reflective of what we do in real life. We don't read an article and answer comprehension questions. We reflect on it. We think about what we read. And that is such an important thing we need to encourage students to do more of, right? So what are the three, two, ones? Well, they are completely flexible, to be honest with you. You can do whatever you like. But what I generally go with is three things I found interesting or surprising or shocking. Um, I often use this one, two things I would like to ask the author or if it's a talk, the presenter. And then the one thing I'd like to fact check. And I, I particularly like this last one because students need to realize that they cannot take everything that they read or hear as gospel. They should think about what the source is and maybe, you know, to double check that information, right? Um, so going back to the text we just read on why we dream, uh, tell, can you, everyone in the chat box, tell me one thing that you found interesting or surprising or shocking? What for you was that? And again, there's no right answer here because it's your own personal views but you'd explain why. Well, I found this part particularly interesting because, or I found this bit really shocking because. So much like we did with the photos within the text. Dreams can be entertaining. I think, yeah, it allows us to process trauma. I think that's amazing, right? I never knew that. So that was a really interesting point. Um, REM helps heal wounds, not just time. There we go. The importance not just of sleep, but dreams as well in that process. Um, and is there anything in there that you would like to fact check, do you think? Because sometimes we read statistics and because it's a really precise statistic, we think, oh, okay, we accept that. So I would probably want to fact check that research in the United States and that, the, the, you know, 17 adults, 150 photos, how, how close is that, is that real? What study proves this idea? Yeah, good. 
Yeah, not dreaming is related to depression, right? I would like to fact check that as well. Definitely, Adrian. Adrian. <laughs> yeah, we have more than one dream at night. I can only re remember one. I uh, Likewise, Fanny. I, I remember one dream if I've dreamt. I barely remember that. as well, Christine. That's very true. You have vague recollections of what it's about, but have difficulty explaining it. Oh, nice. Uh, T. I'd like to ask how an MBI machine works. Interesting. Okay. It's all just coming from the students. It's all personal to them, their views and opinions. And like I said, that's more reflective of what we might do in the real world. Um, like I say, you can do it with readings, you can do it with talks, podcasts, whatever it is you've been listening to. So here, this was a, an interview with a psychologist about the effects of online gaming, for example. Okay, that's a really good um, speaking task, post-reading. But maybe we want to focus more on what students can actually remember, maybe f if they've been reading something a little bit more academic. So we have this routine here called the plus one routine. And this is a thinking routine that allows or provides students with a structure for identifying key ideas and committing them to memory after being presented with new information through a reading or through watching something. And the reason this is important is because research has shown that engaging students in memory work immediately after presenting them with new information helps them to retain that information more effectively. And this is known as retrieval practice. And what it essentially does, it stops students being passive recipients of information into active processes of information through retrieval and application. So, how does it work? So, we've read something, we've watched something. The first thing I want my students to do is to recall as much as they can. And they do this on their own. They generate a list of key ideas that they can remember from the presentation, from the text, that they think is important to hang on to. And please note, they do this from memory. Their books are shut. They can't reread. It's purely what they can remember. What can they recall? Now, give them two or three minutes to do that. Then we move on to step two. But before we move on to step two, I have a question for you. When students do this kind of recall memory activity, do they all remember the same things? Yes or no in the chat box? Of course not, right? They all remember different things, different details. So what then happens? They take their piece of paper and they pass it to the person next to them. And that person reads through the notes that they've been given. And they add one, they plus one to it. Now that might be an elaboration on an existing point. It might be a completely new point. Something that was missing from that person's notes. Or it might be a connection, so making a, or adding a relationship between ideas. But the idea here is for the students to use each other's thinking to build more robust, more detailed, more in-depth notes. In other words, it's making it collaborative. And then you'd repeat that process two or three times. So that by the time that you get your original piece of paper back, your original notes, they have been expanded on by the other students in the class. At which point the students can then review their notes. See what the other people have written, what they added, what they elaborated on, before putting them into groups to share those ideas, to turn it into a discussion. And it might be that they want to raise further questions for consideration, to talk about why 
they thought this was important or that was important. Um, you could turn into a rank order kind of task if you wanted to. So ranking the, the points in order of importance, for example. But it, it kind of makes that note-taking process more collaborative, but it allows you, the teacher, to see, and the teachers, students themselves see what kind of things they remember and how they remember, making that process more visible. And in some ways, it's a bit like a jigsaw reading. Yeah, it's a kind of jigsaw listening. What can you remember? Share those thoughts with each other. Okay. The next task I want to talk to you about is called the four C's. Now, this is not the four C's of 21st century learning, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, or creativity, although it does have elements of that. This is something very different though. It's a thinking routine that provides learners with a structure for a text-based discussion built, about, built around making different connections, asking questions, and so on, right? So it's a discussion activity. So the first C stands for connections. So in groups, what connections do you draw between the text or the talk and your own life or your other learning? So here we've got an article all about technology and sleep. What is the connection? Well, how does that article connect to my life? and my experiences. So, you know, maybe I sleep really badly because I'm looking at my phone until the minute I go to sleep, for example. So how does te technology connect to your impact on your sleep personally, right? Maybe you've learned about that in another class that's so making connections to you and your other learning. The second C is challenge. And this is important because we want students to challenge what they read, to challenge what they hear, not to accept everything at face value. So we pose this question to them. What ideas, what assumptions do you want to challenge or argue with in the text? It's okay to disagree with something. Maybe I disagree with this point. I don't like it. I think this because of X, Y, Z. So we're working together in a group to explain why Exactly. All of these foster critical thinking. Absolutely. The third C is concepts. Or what do you think is the most important thing worth holding on to from the text? So, for example, well, I think this point is the most important thing to hold on from the text because. But you have to explain why. You have to elaborate and give reasons why you think that is the most important point. And of course, different students have different views. So it becomes a discussion. Then the final C, the fourth C, can anyone guess what it might be? So we've got connections, challenge, concepts. What could be the fourth C? Any thoughts, any suggestions? Critic, potentially. I mean, they all involve critical thinking, right? Um, okay, consequences, exactly, uh, Kitty Pong. Um, not quite consequences, but the idea is, oh, Archie, very good. Changes, they're the same as conclusions or consequences. So what changes in attitude, in thinking or action are suggested by the text or the talk? Should I be doing something different? So for example, in this particular text, I know we've not read it, but it is about the impact of technology on, on you know, using your phone before you go to bed, essentially. That idea of blue light not helping your melatonin levels reduce for, for sleep time. So maybe there are no changes that need to be made, but are there? What does it suggest that we should be doing or should not be doing? And the reason this routine works so well, especially with National Geographic Learning content, it's because it's authentic, it's real world, it is meaningful, right? And that is what I love about working with National Geographic content. It relates to the real world, which makes all of these routines really valid and valuable for our students to be talking about in class. 
Okay, a couple of other routines that you could do with your students post reading or post viewing. Um, really simple one. We saw earlier interview the photo, getting them to think about what questions they'd ask that person or the people in the, in the photo. We can do it with the text as well. Interview the person, interview the author. So a lot of texts in NGL books, this one's taken from Reflect, are about people that they may or may not know, but they're about real people. What questions would you like to ask that person or the author? Um, this is a, a really nice video about a, a street artist called Zul from Singapore. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this work, William. Uh, you might be, I don't know. Um, but it gets them again just thinking about it. It's not just taking in information, enjoying a video, enjoying a reading. Think about it on a deeper level. And actually, in that process, there's a degree of creativity because you're coming up with questions as well. Okay, a couple more. Um, before we finish, we've got four minutes. Hopefully I'll finish on time. So this one is called the four ifs. And this routine was developed to build students' exploration of an idea, of an issue, and hopefully move them into consideration of action that they and others can take. And it really links quite nicely with the three whys activity we saw earlier. But it's more focused on action. And it can help students to feel more empowered as citizens. And like I say, it works really well with current events, global issues, dilemmas, environmental issues, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it works really nicely with. So we've got this article here all about closing the circle on waste. So about recycling, reusing, reducing our waste output. So the first if is if I take this idea, if I take this ideal seriously, what will happen? How will it help? The second if is if my community takes this ideal seriously, how can it impact? How will it help the local community? Third one, you're gonna guess, is a wider focus. If our nation or if the world takes this idea seriously, how will it impact? How will it help? So again, it's looking at it from different perspectives. But actually, for me, the most powerful if is the fourth one. Can anyone guess what the fourth if might be? So if, if I take it seriously, if my community takes it seriously, if the nation, if the world takes it seriously, perfect will, perfect Daniel. If nobody takes it seriously, if we don't do anything, what will happen? And that is a really powerful idea for students to discuss, to get them thinking about, well, if we don't do this, this is gonna happen. And that's why it works so well with those kind of real world content, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, global issues. So it creates really in-depth discussion. Okay. Um, let me jump to this one because time is up. So the last routine is a really quick one. It's just called, I used to think, now I think. And essentially it's a routine that helps students to reflect on their thinking about a topic or an issue and how and why that thinking may or may not have changed. So it consolidates new learning as they identify their understanding, their opinions, their beliefs about a topic. And you could do this at the end of a lesson where you've watched something or read something, or you could do it at the end of a unit because we know books are very thematic, they cover a whole topic. What do I think at the end of that unit about this particular one? So here we have a, a video all about cultural borrowing and if it's a good thing or not. Well, at the beginning, I thought this about cultural viewing, or cultural borrowing. Now I think this. Before I thought it was a bad thing, maybe now I think it's a good thing. So it allows them to examine how those, that thinking has changed. And by doing so, they're developing their reasoning skills 
as well as recognizing sort of relationships between ideas. Okay, my time is up. I apologize, I'm kind of gone a little bit over. But in conclusion, try to introduce visible thinking routines into the English language, language classroom too. First of all, develop deeper thinking and analysis to drive communication in the classroom. That is what we want. We want all students involved, sharing their views, sharing their opinions. And in addition to that, it makes learning more personalized and more meaningful. And those are all things which we need to make the language learning classroom a more successful place. So I'm gonna leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, which I think really sums up what I wanna talk about. Education is not about learning facts, but training the brain to think. And introducing these visible thinking routines into your teaching is one way of doing that. So take some time this evening to reflect. What did you used to think about visible thinking routines? And what do you think now? And what routines might you like to try in your classrooms? So I'm gonna give you a couple of websites quickly. So if you want more information, you can download all of the worksheets, all of the PDFs for these activities from the Project Zero Thinking Routines website. Take a screenshot, copy it down quickly. I'm not sure if Will can put it in the chat box. pz.harvard.edu thinking or forward slash thinking hyphen routines. That's the first thing to point out. The second point, is that all of the example lessons today came from National Geographic Learning's new Reflect series. There's reading and writing strand and a listening and speaking strand. Uh, and it's a, it's a great series because it has such great content which works really well with these visible thinking routines. Otherwise, as you know, you can stay in touch with National Geographic Learning through our webinars, through the InFocus blog as well. So thank you ever so much for being a wonderful, wonderful audience today. Being so interactive, so chatty. It makes one hour go in a flash. Okay, so thank you so much. And for my first time delivering a webinar in, in Asia, I, I'm very impressed with all of you. So thank you for coming to listen to me today, okay? And I'm gonna hand over to Will because he's got a couple of things he would like to share with you as well. I do. So thank Will, you. Over to you. Thank you very much. And I just want to say thank you so much for that amazing session. You've given us so many ideas and strategies for the classroom, a really practical session. And um, just, you know, just from my point of view, um, what I loved about it is you started off from something really, really simple, you know, like uh, I see, I think, I wonder. And you've kind of like gone through this whole progression to things which are really very deep and really, really thought provoking. And so you've given us a huge range. And the other thing I thought was fantastic is that a lot of those ideas are really a launch pad. Like you could take one of those ideas and you could really adapt it. Like just as an example, like the three, two, one you showed us, where you said, take, you know, write down three things you found interesting, but you could tailor that, couldn't you? So, you know, Absolutely. depending on the article that you've read, one thing you find interesting, one thing you find scary, one thing you find unbelievable. So yeah, just each one of those ideas, I saw how I could expand on that, you know, using that concept. Yeah. So I just want to say to everyone out there, just as a reminder, um, we are going to send you, actually, let me share my screen for a minute. We are going to share, uh, send you um, an email tomorrow. And in that email uh, will be your certificate, but also we're going to send you a recording of the session. And I really recommend you go back and watch that again, um, you know, maybe pause and take some notes um, because I think so many things you can do, you know, with so little preparation, you know, where um, I spent many years in the classroom and I used to spend ages preparing activities, cutting things up, you know, printing stuff out. And with most of these, you can just go in and you can just do it immediately, you know, with whatever you're teaching in yeah. there, the picture, the listening, and that is fantastic for teachers, right, Alex? And I, think, I think, yeah, you've hit on two things there. The, flex the flexibility of, of these routines is, is massive, but also the fact that, 
you can sort of expand on them as, as much as you want to. And there's no preparation. Yeah. You know, all teachers want a bag of no prep activities. Yeah. Uh, and this is what we're giving this you right it. here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, You've given it to us. Course. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay great yeah so hold on for that email tomorrow okay your certificate and the recording will be in there uh, a couple of other things i'd like to do um i put these into the chat box just now but i'll do it again um here we go so uh we've got our webinar page there um actually we've got two webinar page, global and our asia webinar page um i want to promote um a couple of uh, webinars that we've got coming up. Some of you might recognize Chia Swan Chong here. Um, she is uh, one of our National Geographic Learning authors, um, and she's doing a webinar on October the 5th about developing mediation skills uh, for intercultural communication. Just give me one second. I'm going to give you a the direct link so that you can uh, register for that right now. Um, I, I would you thoroughly recommend registering because she is a fantastic speaker and you'll get loads of great ideas from her right well exactly yeah there we go so yeah so please join us uh for cheers session and then um i'm doing a session next week as well um i'm doing it uh on communication skills and we're going to be learning about how to say no okay um if you're like me uh, you probably end up with far too many things to do in your life because uh, you don't want to let people down well we're going to be learning about how Actually, uh, in a lot of ways, it's beneficial for everyone if you do say no. So we're going to join me yeah. to learn about how to do that. Um, I'm well, going Will, to... that's because we're British. We don't know how to say no, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I've just put the registration links into the chat box for you there. Um, yeah, what else was I going to say? Yeah, so basically, uh, you should be able to see that on your screen now. So please join us uh, here on Asia on Facebook. Uh, we're on WeChat. We're also on YouTube. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can connect with us, uh, become part of our network of teachers. Um, actually, the final thing I want to show you, uh, I think you can see this here. If you go um, to the uh, Reflect website, which I'm now going to drop in the chat box as well. Uh, let me put that in there. If you go to the Reflect website, um, you can actually try a sample unit for yourself. Um, so I recommend this is something that you'd be able to do. Go to the website, okay, click on the menu here, you can see, um, and you will see this option here, try a sample unit, try a unit. Um, and there are full units um, of the program that Alex was using today, Reflect, which you can download as a PDF, and you could take that into your classroom um, you could try it out. You could use some of the content there. You could use some of Alex's visual thinking routine. So I recommend you do that. Get something in your hand uh, or on your computer that you can use in the classroom. I'm sure, uh, like Alex and myself, that you will enjoy uh, using that Reflect content. It's a fantastic series for academic learners of English. Yeah, okay. great lessons. Yeah. Yeah, and loads of great lessons. For the listening, and if, for the listening lessons, that all the audio is there as well. Right. Okay, there we go. There we go. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. We're a little bit over time, but I think it was worth it. So, yeah, hold on for your great. email mm -hmm. from us by the end of tomorrow for your certificate and the recording. Okay. Take care, everyone. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at a future webinar, hopefully at mine next week. Okay. I gave you the... Uh, I gave you the sign up details there. So please join us. And um, we hope to invite Alex, we hope to inv invite you back again soon for another. For another I'd love session. to come back. Great. Thank you happen. very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Okay, Stay well. Goodbye. 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 Yeah.